uh, answered that, but it looks like I froze or dropped out for a okay, second. So it's, it's recording now, so you can restart. Okay. okay. So, um, right, so Subudai and I were talking, well, have been talking extensively about uh, continual lifelong learning and uh, in general and specifically in how we might implement it. Um, and there's this review, this very long review, as uh, Jeff pointed out, on uh, lifelong learning uh, in biological systems and uh, in artificial neural networks. So <clears throat> today I wanted to go over the uh, biological aspects of lifelong learning part, which is basically uh, a, re well, a short hash of the different mechanisms of plasticity in the brain and uh, how how the brain avoids catastrophic forgetting, uh, but to, you know this that this part of the review was pretty not vague, but I'd say like not detailed enough. So what uh, I wanted to do today is take an uh, overview of learning and memory in the brain, um, and what but with uh, from the perspective of how it can do continual learning. So I'll start all the way from development, get into different way uh, mechanisms of synaptic plasticity, and then different uh, interesting new ways that. Uh, neurons can can learn in supervised or unsupervised ways and then also uh briefly uh talk about systems consolidation and uh, the fact that we uh overwrite our memories to an extent when we uh recall them so okay, that that's great and this is something we haven't really done in the past before uh and just as a kind of reminder to everyone just one of our underlying motivations uh of course the htm sequence memory does do continuous learning and it does it really well um, and so one of our motivations is to see if we can take some of those principles that are in the sequence memory um, there are a number of uh, aspects to it that lead to continuous learning and then apply them to practical machine learning systems as well and so this is just sort of a background task of understanding what the biology some of the other biological work that's been done on on lifelong learning and continuous learning right thanks um, so starting uh, from the very beginning, uh, one thing that people are exploring in uh, deep networks and so on, uh, but that I think hasn't been uh, emphasized enough or isn't very well explored, uh, is the fact that the, the brain is not a blank slate with a number of random connections in it. It has a very rich and detailed architecture, um, which, which facilitates the compartmentalization of um, of different tasks and of uh, learning and memory in those tasks. So this is a, uh, <clears throat> this figure here shows uh, schematically how, can you guys see my mouse? Yes. Okay, so this figure shows schematically, for example, how retinal ganglion cell axons from the retina are guided to different parts of uh, here, the superior colliculus and the, and the frog, uh, which is very, based on very early work. Uh, based on uh, chem chemical gradients that exist both in the retina and in the target area. So these chemical gradients uh, can repel or attract axons that are growing, axon growth cones, uh, to, to go in different directions and reach different targets. And here you see in the retina there's efferent A and efferent B, and these uh, can uh, create a, like a tem uh, dorsal, ventral, and uh, temporal, uh, sorry, uh, temporal and medial, uh, depending on the anatomy of the animal, uh, gradients, and the combination of these gradients directs axon growth. So the growth of axons is already very targeted. And as a dynamically uh, regulated process, for example, in most animals, axons overshoot to an extent their target area. And where here, for example, is a termination zone where, where you want the axons to be. Uh, they overshoot them because these uh, chemical gradients are sort of rough, right? And then there are additional refining mechanisms uh, using uh, both like instruments within the, within the neuron uh, and, and also additional factors, additional molecular factors that are extrinsic to refine that and uh, prune overextended synapses put them, um, you know, put them roughly in the right area and then dynamically prune them further with neurotrophic factors, for example. So synapse selection isn't just a learning based thing, it's a developmental uh, 
uh, thing to a large extent. Um, and I'm not going to go over uh, a lot of what's in here, but what I wanted to say about this is that you have a lot of molecular mechanisms, uh, <clears throat> a lot of molecular uh, mechanisms involved in this sort of selection of which synapses get to stay and which ones have to leave. So these are uh, talking about a uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is one of these factors that is excreted by postsynaptic neurons. And this is an axon that's sort of growing in that direction and is uh, pushing out little uh, boutons. Um, and basically, you know, if, uh, if a certain plasticity requirement is met, if there's enough uh, basic, you know, you can think about this as a Hebbian style thing, uh, the, <clears throat> the coincidence activation of uh, the um, postsynaptic neuron when uh, this axon is present uh, will help uh, will release the neurotrophic factors that give the uh, give the axon a survival signal. Uh, Before you go on, Iris, I, I, don't, I don't know if you were done on this slide or not, but I want to make a point, you know, this overshoot is interesting. Um, we know in the cortex that the, uh, the ends of dendrites are continually overshooting throughout your life, meaning they're always growing and reaching out. And if they don't find anything to connect to, they retract again. Um, and so this is an important part of uh, continuous learning. It's not just a development mm -hmm. issue. I don't know that it, in this particular example what, what it is, but in the cortex, that's a strategy um, that the brain uses all the time. It's just these things are always like, growing out and retracting and growing out and retracting. Uh, and, and just to remind, in our models, we, we don't need to model that because that's just really changing the size of your, your, um, your potential synapse pool. And so uh, we have all the way, we don't need to model the growing part, but, but you, can, you can model it by just expanding or contracting your potential synapse pool. I just wanna make that point that I didn't know this happened during development like that. That was an interesting picture you showed, um, but it is happening all the time in the cortex. Uh, Jeff, in the example you gave the dendrites, are they growing towards right. something uh, like and uh, well, uh, well, I think the evidence is they do the following. Um, they, they, if they find some synapses that are useful, and, and, and that's kind of like the complex diagram on the right here that Eric is showing, but you know, basically you can just think like, if they find something where heavy learning says, yes, I can reinforce this because it's, it's useful for me, um, then they grow from there. And if they find more, they will establish synapses and they keep growing. Uh, I don't, I, I, they see it sort of, sort of go in the same direction. I don't think it's, at that point, there's no, I don't believe in the cortex there's any of these the gradients that are being followed. It's more like, hey, if I found something interesting over here, I'll keep looking over here. If I don't, I'll retract. So the, the, the extent of the dendrites in, in live brains can grow and, and retract uh, very dynamically um, day to day. But not, uh, follow, yeah. not, but not following a, uh, any kind of gradient at that point. So apparently, uh, I just did a quick Google search while you were saying that. Uh, I think there are different neurotrophic factor gradients, maybe during um, uh, during adulthood. I don't know if this is specific to like new newly formed neurons in the hippocampus or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, so these are um, this developmental process is a large more uh, initially much more uh, coarse grained uh, than what happens in the adult when you're growing uh, new synapses or dendritic segments, right? So this, this can overshoot by uh, large fractions of a millimeter, uh, whereas here you're talking about much smaller, much more low. Yeah, I think, um, I think in the cortex, it's, it's, in the it's, 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 I just want to make a point uh, that this Yeah, this is a good point I will look into. It, the overshooting part, yeah, I, I don't think we can make equivalent between cortex and other parts like the frog's uh, superior colliculus. So I, was, I want to make that clear. But the, I, the general idea that you, you grow until you find something useful and then you establish that is, is throughout the brain. And, um, and as, soon as, you know, as soon as some cell loses useful synapses on some dendritic branch, that dendritic branch usually disappears. It just retracts again. So it, it's um, maybe different mechanisms at different times, but it's a general strategy of, of dynamic. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, of course, I wasn't trying to... Uh argue against that. I was just pointing out like that there are different yeah, forms of this process. Yeah. Like basically. Um, 
So, uh, and this, uh, this developmental component is also important, for example, for creating uh, distinct cortical areas as well. So here you see, um, here these sort of uh, countered colors here in the telencephalon represent gradients in the ventricular zone of different factors uh, that lead to different gene expression. So you see these gradients in gene expression uh, that can form in all sorts of different ways. And molecularly, this leads to, uh, this can interesting, through interesting feedback mechanisms, can lead to very sharp distinctions between these vague gradients. Um, and this also happens in the, um, when, uh, so maybe information overload here, but uh, this happens when the cortex itself is layering, is forming layering, there's these different genetic factors that are expressed. Uh, and they lead to uh, distinct er anatomically distinct areas, uh, such that basically uh, the the inputs, you know, where where each axon sends targets, uh, infracortically and uh, intracortically uh, changes. So, uh, and and here, of course, most of you are probably familiar with uh, this type of diagram. Uh, this is a, a diagram showing how the cortex itself is formed. Uh, starting with the uh, progenital cells in uh, the ventricular zone uh, that then start dividing asymmetrically uh, to form uh, layers sort of top to bottom. And right, so and then moving to the, does anybody have any more questions on the development stuff? Because I, I won't be talking about this after this. No. So um, looking a little bit more of, you know, in a more detailed view, uh, we all know that uh, synapses can potentiate or be depressed. And uh, <clears throat> like, uh, like we discussed before, concurrent heart uh, can lead to long-term potentiation, uh, which is sort of, this is the early work of uh, Eric Kandel in the plesia is where this sort of all started, uh, showing that, for example, uh, the activation of a postsynaptic cell, the concurrent uh, activation of postsynaptic cell, uh, trafficking of uh, glutamate receptors in the postsynapse, making it more active, it leads to, uh, this isn't here, oh, it is here actually, uh, NMDA receptor activation, which means that when the postsynaptic component is depolarized, this kicks out uh, a magnesium uh, ion in the NMDA receptor, uh, which, allows, uh, which allows it to uh, lead to an influx of calcium, which triggers a lot of, uh, a lot of plasticity mechanisms, both locally and globally, through uh, gene transcription. Uh, here, so for example, this is one of the earliest known uh, factors that are activated when uh, when you get this, uh, this type of plasticity it's called CRED. And this leads to a lot of protein synthesis uh, in the synapse, in many synapses actually, and it's still unclear how this leads to selective, uh, selective uh, synapse uh, potentiation, even though there are a lot of interesting theories on that. Yeah. And of course you can, mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, I, th I think it's, uh, for those who may not know this, I, th I think it's worth um, um, an overall observation here. The aplysia mm -hmm. and other very simple animals uh, the nervous systems are so small that pretty much everything is genetically determined. I'm not sure in the aplysia if this is true for, but every, every single neuron in the aplysia is, is like accounted for and can be, um, can be numbered. And, and, and I believe most, if not all the synapses are that way too. And so in these very simple nervous systems, this connectivity is, is primarily genetically determined. And then all memory has to be come through synaptic potentiation and depression because it doesn't, it doesn't exhibit those things we were just talking about, like continuous growth of you know, dendrites and so on. So when you get to more complex animals, um, that there isn't enough information in the genetic code to specify the connectivity in the brain. It's just not, it's not possible. So the connectivity has to come about, um, the detailed connectivity has to come about later through, through learning processes. And, and this, this um, has led to, sort of, uh, for many, many years, this has led to this idea that only learning, by studying animals like aplysia, people felt like, well, learning has to occur through synaptic potentiation, because that's how it occurs in simple animals. 
But in complex animals in the cortex, we now know that's not true. It's that most learning occurs from the formation of new synapses, at least that's a lot of people believe that. So I just want to make that very clear that you have to be thinking about these things. When we talk about learning in these simple animals, it's always going to be like this. But in complex animals, it, on top of synaptic potentiation depression, you're going to have all this synaptic genesis, which is you know, a huge thing. So I just, I, I, I'm not sure everyone listening to this will understand that distinction. So I just thought I'd make it clear. Sorry. Yeah, right. I, 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 Jeff, is there a uh, philological cut point between uh, what the mechanisms you ascribe to uh, simple animals versus complex animals? I don't know of it, Kevin. I, I, my guess is that even in our brain, some of the early stuff like your spinal cord and, the, and brain stem and so on might be genetically determined. Uh, I don't know that. I'm guessing that. Um, uh, so uh, I'm not, I, I don't know any clear distinctions between it. I do know that in very simple animals, and it's the reason like Ken Dell and Schwartz studied the, the placebo, is that you can, you can literally count every animal having the exact same nervous system. <laughs> and therefore, um, you know, uh, and somewhere along the way, you know, we've developed this hugely plastic neocortex. Uh, so there's probably in our own brains, there's a, there's a mixture of these things. I'm almost certain that there is. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that. And uh, just to point out, uh, first of all, interestingly, another reason that uh, people study the plesia and the squid and the frog uh, in the beginning was because their neurons and axons are huge. You can almost see them by, with your naked eye. So they're much easier to record from when you have like limited technology like they did in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I'd also like to point out that the, um, the there's an, inter there's an intermediate component to, uh, to uh, synapse generation and, co and connectivity in uh, quote unquote complex animals in a sense that these, uh, it's not just the genetics of uh, the predetermined genetics like in uh, invertebrates, uh, like, the, like the aplesia, but there's a, the, this, this stage where there's axon growth and pruning uh, is, not very, is not really activity dependent. It's sort of the dynamic, genetically regulated process. Um, right. Uh, so in addition to long-term potentiation, of course, you have long-term depression. Sure, sure. I just have a question on the LTP. LTP. So this, uh, the basic mechanism of LTP, as per my understanding, is not through uh, gene expression, right? You're showing there is an influx of caution and more caution is going to be to uh, it's going to add an AMPA receptor there. So there is no gene expression involved in that stage, or is there? Uh, there is. It's, uh, there's both short-term and long-term components to it. So yeah, the long-term components actually come from uh, reinforcing structural or creating structural elements in the, the pre and post synapse. And these require gene expression. So there are some interesting things. I think that there are like uh, some of these elements are just sitting around there uh, that have been, you know, recently, um, recently synthesized. So like proteins and well, mostly proteins uh, that can be phosphorylated. Uh, this just means that they're altered slightly by activity like a cal calcium influx and they lead to local, uh, so local uh, creation of, um, of these scaffolding proteins and other reinforcement proteins. Uh, and then there's another, the other component which leads to gene expression. And this re helps reinforce the synapse uh, as well, but it also sends, because once you get uh, gene expression here, the, the, the nucleus doesn't know where the signal came from, it doesn't know which, uh, which segment it came from. So it sends these uh, potentiating factors everywhere in the neurons to all, uh, <clears throat> to all spines, uh, I think. And then this leads to like further potenti uh, potentiation that happens later. Uh, so if you activate once, if you potentiate one synapse, you could potentiate other synapses in the same neuron. Uh, so this leads to like, let's say second order associative uh, learning, for example. But the, the gene expression component is very crucial to uh, long-term potentiation. I, I want to make clear, Lucas, you understood that answer because we were talking a moment ago about gene expression, uh, genes defining the architecture of the brain, and, and, and we're not talking about that now. Uh, maybe that's obvious to you. Now we're talking about when the synapse potentiates, anytime you've got proteins involved, genes are expressed, and you know, there's genetic mechanisms that are 
that are behind all this protein stuff. But that's not that's not saying it has anything to do with the architecture at that moment. It's just right. just how cells build things. Right. Um, okay. So right, and of course, in addition to long-term potentiation, you have a long-term depression, which happens when there's a let's say inadequate pre and post uh, firing, like an inadequate co coincidence. So you know, this they're out of time. The timing is off, or the uh, there's just not enough input that's driving the postsynaptic cell. And then there's another number of genetic and molecular mechanisms that, um, that lead to depression of that synapse. Uh, so the problem is that, uh, I'll, I'll just stick here because so people don't get confused by the next slide. The problem is that this basic Hebbian learning is not really enough uh, to do uh, most interesting things. So for example, Hebbian learning, which is a correlative uh, form of learning that you, know, you could describe as like the product uh, naively as a product of the activation of the pre and post synaptic neuron or, or synaptic, uh, synaptic segments uh, would lead to uh, runaway activity. So uh, excessive activation, basically. And also this only allows you to form sort of uh, short term, it allows you to form uh, correlation, correlations of things that happen very close in time to each other. So for distal learning, where you have to learn uh, associations between the events that occurred within uh, hundreds of milliseconds or seconds, you, you can't really do that with this vanilla uh, heavy and learning uh, style. So you need more components. Uh, and one component is uh, homeostatic plasticity, which uh, prevents this runaway activation and make sure that not all synapses are recruited when there's a coincident activity, uh, and also that the synapses don't lead to, uh, the reinforced synapses don't lead to runaway excessive activity in, uh, in neurons. So this, uh, there's a little slide that I'm sort of presenting where there's a vague controller signal that uh, adapts the, you know, that controls the synaptic uh, strength. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, that controls the synaptic strength. And this can come in various different forms. So one of them is the excitatory inhibitory balance where inhibitory neurons create like a, let's say, uh, they, they correct large deviations from uh, the basal firing rate, for example. And there's other uh, mechanisms that, um, that are both intracellular or extracellular, meaning coming from uh, other sources that uh, create negative feedback loops that uh, allow, that stop that because as I mentioned before, you can't learn, uh, you can't learn uh, associations that are longer than the, whatever is in your spike timing uh, dependent plasticity window, which is on the order of a few milliseconds at best. So uh, there's, you can use uh, what's called three factor plasticity which is when uh, neurons are coactive. Let's see, so uh, here you have a pre and post synaptic neuron. So there's um, the green, green is presynaptic, orange is post synaptic. And you can have your standard heavy plasticity occurring here, but you can have uh, uh, instead, of this, instead of this activation leading to immediate uh, reinforcement of the synapse, basically you create what's called an eligibility trace. And the eligibility trace where you have something basically a, depolar, a local depolarization that is sustained uh, over uh, long periods of time. By long, I mean like hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and if, if nothing happens during this, uh, before the decay of this uh, eligibility trace, the, the synapse is only minimally reinforced. Uh, whereas you can get this third factor, which is a neuromodulatory factor, so dopamine or acetylcholine that acts uh, that if, if this, uh, if this uh, neuromodulatory bouton, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this neuromodulatory bouton uh, activates the local, the local area, the segment, basically will, uh, and it coincides with the eligibility trace, then it can gate plasticity. Uh, does this make sense to everyone? Okay. 
So uh, what happens like here just, is just... that basically the eligibility trace takes uh, a while and time to handle. Uh, sorry, Jeff. Oh, I was, I was gonna say, just, just if it's not clear, like that third factor could be something like an emotional response that says, hey, this was dangerous, remember this, that kind of thing. Right, it could be, yeah, it could be anything, right? We don't know exactly what causes all kinds of, uh, yeah. No, but so we, we, do, we, we do know that that, that, that is. It could be a temporal different signal. Yeah, but uh, we do know there are these, you know, these, uh, there are definitely these neuromodulators uh, that are diffused throughout the brain to say, hey, this is important, remember this now, don't ever forget it type of thing. Uh, so that's one of those yeah. factors. That, that would be an example, I guess, of a third factor. Exactly, yeah. So anything that neuromodulators can do, uh, you, you can sort of imagine uh, taking part in this three factor, um, three factor model. I'm just pointing out, we're talking about lifelong so learning. So I just I'd like to go over, uh, by the way, I highly recommend this. Yeah, yes, right. Thank you, Jeff. So the idea is here that you can, uh, you can create more interesting, uh, uh, more interesting uh, associations than just the sort of things that occur at the same time. You can have things that are predictive or postdictive, for example, that learn uh, things that happen distally in time. Uh, by adding this gating mechanism. That's one of the ways you uh, yeah. can do that. I, I'm so just wondering if you're talking, learning, this is uh, an advantage. If we're trying to build systems that do lifelong learning, it, you know, learning is not a continuous function. You know, we learn all the time. Every time you do anything, you have some memory trace. But if you were building a true, you know, an intelligent robot or something, an intelligent machine, there are some things you, that are more important to remember that occurred and you don't want to forget them. And so you have to have this gating factor that says, yes, this is really important. We're going to form a permanent memory here. Something else is temporary. We're, not, we're going to forget it in a day. And we don't have anything like that in, our, in our, um, uh, any of the work we've done, but it would be easy to add. Um, I, just, I just want to put it, I'm trying to raise this up out of the detailed neurobiology a bit, or as I hope you don't mind. Yeah, I know that, that I'm glad you interjected. Because some of this stuff can be just terribly difficult to understand if you, don't, you haven't read this stuff before. <laughs> Jeff, uh, just a follow up question on that. So, would this uh, long, would this different uh, order of learning all be uh, using synaptic growth? Yeah, we, we do we, before. yeah, well, we've modeled this in, in our work as this potential synapses, which could be, um, and then you have some permanence, right? And um, uh, the term permanence was chosen to reflect this idea, even though we didn't quite do it that way. Um, so the idea here is, um, I'm sorry, I actually forgot your question, Lucas. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my question is, uh, so these different things we're learning, right? Uh, yeah. Different orders. Are we all, are we using the same mechanism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I, what, are what, we what, using different mechanisms? It's, you're using the same mechanisms of synaptic genesis and synaptic plasticity. So you're still doing this sort of at the level of the synapse, but synapses are very complex functions. And some, some go away, right? You know, they, if you don't use them, they disappear tomorrow. That's, it happens all the time. But some get, get like permanently glued, you know, super glued. Okay, this one's never going to go away. Um, and, and you're going to stick with it for the rest of your life type of thing. But it's still a synapse. Um, so it's a variation of the, it's just, it's just the permanence of that synapse. And it's, it, it's more, it's almost like, I, I read this paper once, but people talked about, you know, synaptic plasticity and the, and the weight of a synapse. And someone said, you know, it doesn't really look like that. It's really like how permanent the synapse is. That's the most important thing. And so it's the same mechanisms, but don't think about it. It's just like a weight going up and down. You can also assign to it some, some other factor that says this one's going to last for at least a day. This one's going to last for your life type of thing. But what, what would make a synapse less more time? Right. Well, ultimately, it's a, it's, a, it's a structural change to the synapses. There would be, you know, these channels, the, the genes that are expressed there. Um, physically, the, um, a synapse is very permanent, gets, gets bigger and thicker, and you physically looks more robust. Um, but there would be, there would be um, you know, obviously genetic and growth things and proteins that, you know, it could, it's just, 
you know, it's, it, it has a different protein structure and different um, molecular structure that keeps it permanent. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, another uh, point with the, with the sorry, homeostatic sorry. stuff, um, uh, if you go back to that slide, uh, you know, when you, you mentioned sort of homeostasis, and I think there's at least two different types of homeostasis that, that you might have mentioned. One is kind of homeostatic uh, activity so that the overall activity of the network is kept to within a certain range. And of course, in our, situ in our case, we use, do that by imposing sparsity. sparsity. Um, and you know, that essentially puts some limits on how, much, how many cells at a time could be active. Then right. there's kind of homeostatic plasticity, which might be some kind of bound on how much learning can actually occur in a given uh, you know, dendritic segment and so on. And we've talked about that before, but our temporal memory models don't explicitly have uh, have something like that. It's you know something that says uh, you know if you grow some synapses here, well you have to decrease uh, other synapses there. You know you're keeping kind of a bound on the total number of uh, synapses or synaptic uh, you know the total amount of permanence, if you will, in a dendritic segment. Uh, those mech that that mechanism does happen in biology, but we don't incorporate that in in our temporal memory explicitly. Right, uh, of course. So, uh, Suta so said, yeah, so this, there's the activity dependent hom uh, homeostasis, which is uh, largely through inhibitory interneurons that say, okay, uh, this cell gets to fire, the other ones shut up. Um, and the synaptic part is also complex, as you mentioned. So, I, I'm not very familiar with local mechanisms. Uh, for example, within a dendritic segment, you know, if one synapse is reinforced, if there's like a negative feedback mechanism that says, okay, other guys should not be reinforced with this event. Um, yeah, there are mechanisms like that where it's it's almost like the total spine, <laughs> you know, volume of the spines is conserved. You know, so if, if some spines right. become larger, others have to become smaller. It's, you know, it's, it's almost inevitable. If you think about, uh, as we believe now, that you know, this heavy in plasticity is working within a local eight range of a dendritic branch. So the typical number is like 40 microns. And... So within 40 microns, you can get about 40 synapses. And, and they can be self-free and, you know, they're happy to be all exist there. But if you try to add more synapses, there's no room for them. And so they have to extend beyond this, this area. And then they, they kind of leave the synaptic integration zone and they start acting independently. So there's physical things like that which could enforce uh, a limit to, you know, you, you can't have 200 synapses that are all contributing together on a dendritic branch to generating a dendritic spike. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of limited. You're like, you get like 40, you know, something like that. And you can use that 40 any way you want, but you're not going to get 200. Absolutely. Further, right? more than, sorry, go on. Uh, with energy consumption also impose a limit there? With what? Yeah, so I was going to just bring this up. So energy, cons uh, energy consumption uh, as well, in, uh, implicitly and explicitly, I guess. Uh, but also the fact that so uh, spines, you know, synapses can only reach a certain size, right? Uh, and this is, uh, this is something that is determined quasi-genetically, for example. They cannot, like, grow to, like, a, the size of a neuron, for example. Uh, and there's also a scaling mechanism uh, with, that says, you know, if, if this synapse has, is really, if this uh, boot, uh, sorry, <clears throat> the spine is really small, uh, then, then uh, you know, it, it's more, it's e it can grow easier, for example. So, it, you know, if this, there's not like an interesting synapse formed there and something happens, the, the growth is uh, sort of proportional to, inversely proportional to the size uh, to the size of that synapse, to the strength of that synapse. But also there's a negative feedback mechanism when, when the uh, synapse is really big. Uh, it can also, you know, the, there's mechanisms in place that mean that if it becomes irrelevant, it can also uh, shrink. So uh, any further observations or questions on this part? Yeah. We, we've modeled this in our models that with a single yeah. variable permanence, which represents zero, like there's no synapse, to you know, 0.1, you're starting to grow one. To 0.4, you've got a, a minimum functional synapse. To you know, one, it's like it's it's the biggest you can get. It, it we've always felt that there have to be other factors in, ultimately in the brain to represent more of like um, 
more of its, its true permanence that, that some synapses would never go away. But anyway, we've modeled this with a single variable and it worked pretty well so far. Yeah, right, of course, I was gonna mention that too. And yeah, the, and there's this scaling, right, which uh, sort of encourages new uh, weak synapses to grow if something interesting happens. Yeah. Um, so uh, one quick, uh, one quick, just a time check. So it's 11.05, I think uh, if we're oh, gonna well. give this part an hour, um, you know, probably another 15 minutes and then we can always continue at another time as well. Uh, I'm nearly done. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I hope so. Yeah. So when did we start like 11, like 10, 20 or something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I highly recommend this review by McGee and Greenberger, uh, which is very new, um, where they talk a lot about basically all of these problems in heavy plasticity and all the interesting ways that uh, brains might overcome them. Uh, so this is our basic he Hebbian uh, STDP. So this is st spike timing dependent plasticity, which is Hebbian learning. Uh, when there, the, the pre and post synaptic uh, activation happens within a certain window, right? And if uh, it happens outside of this window, basically you're not gonna reinforce the synapse. So, uh, but you can, uh, but you, you need to make this more uh, sophisticated for reasons that I mentioned before. Uh, so you can have the neuromodulated part, which I also talked about. And here you can see the eligibility trace, which is this postsynaptic voltage, for example. Uh, and then if this occurs with a neuromodulatory induced uh, EPSP uh, voltage, then this can uh, lead to this gating like uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff mentioned. And then there are ways in which you can devise the supervised learning uh, in, uh, in neurons by having an instructive pathway input, which uh, is mostly pictured to be in the, um, the uh, sort of distal segments of the neuron. And this feed forward learning uh, and this feed forward uh, input, which basically says that this, uh, so that, for example, the instructive pathway could be an, an error signal. It says this is a desired, the desired output versus the actual output of the neuron. So let's say that you want to make this neuron that's giving this input uh, you want to make it shut up. So basically you get an error signal that comes, uh, that generates a dendritic spike, and this can alter the, the firing of the neuron uh, in response to the feed forward input such that it goes up or down uh, to minimize that error. Uh, and then uh, they have uh, behavioral timescale plasticity, which I'll get into in a second, which is very interesting. Uh, so in terms of the supervised learning, you can uh, have this in various ways. So here, uh, panel B is, uh, this is talking about Purkinje cells in the cerebellum uh, that receive uh, an actual error signal from the ascending fibers. And so you can make a comparison and this can happen extrinsically through like a, an inhibitory element. Uh, and this error is fed into the, creates a dendritic spike, which uh, influences the, uh, the output of the, the output of the neuron. Uh, and in cortex, uh, you could do this by, uh, you know, using a, uh, <clears throat> again, using mechanisms that are local to the dendrite, meaning that the error can be made uh, explicitly in the sense that the, the, pre the instructive signal comes from another neuron, uh, or implicitly in the sense that the dendrite itself, the dendritic segment can calculate errors uh, between different uh, between different inputs that it gets, uh, and create this t teaching signal. Uh, and of course, you can involve inhibitory circuits here to uh, make this more sophisticated. And then there's uh, the concept of uh, behavioral timescale synaptic plasticity, which is something that was very recently discovered in the hippocampus, which does not require this Hebbian uh, association uh, component. So what happens here? Uh, I don't know, probably Jeff and uh, some other people are probably familiar with this. What happens is that, let's say you're a neuron uh, in CA1 of the hippocampus, and you get a bunch of excitatory inputs from CA3 or uh, the entorhinal cortex. But because of excitatory inhibitory balance, uh, and you basically, you don't fire. This is the voltage trace of the, the neuron, that, the CA1 neuron. You don't fire. But then, let's say you're, <clears throat> the mouse is uh, exploring here, it gets all these inputs, and then there's uh, an event happens, let's say it reaches a certain location or it sees a certain landmark or something, and you create this uh, calcium plateau. Uh, and this comes from a neuron in CA3 or uh, the entorhinal cortex. 
And this plateau basically drives plasticity of the inputs that occur, uh, that uh, these presynaptic inputs that we talked about earlier, which leads to their reinforcement. And the fact that you could do this uh, with an eligibility trace and the fact that the calcium plateau is very long lasting means that uh, you, don't, you don't only reinforce synapses uh, for neurons that fired exactly when you were at that point in time, uh, but ones that occurred earlier as well, which uh, is why place fields uh, <clears throat> can occur like very quickly. This is a very quick mechanism. So they can, they can happen like within uh, like one shot learning basically as soon as the event is experienced. Uh, and also the, um, and, and why they're not very sharp. They, they're predictive in a sense. So you can create predictive representations uh, using this uh, plasticity mechanism due to the fact that the calcium plateau is long and that you have these overlap, temporally overlapping inputs coming in. Um, is everyone on board with this? Yeah, I, I just wanna make one comment about uh, cautionary comment on the images on the left. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, they're, they're showing, um, they show these synapses appearing on the, the red little circles on the cell body. Uh, I don't know if PC stands for pyramidal cell. I'm not sure what that is. A Purkinje cell. A Purkinje, okay, Purkinje cell. So um, Purkinje cells are very, very unusual neurons. So, but if we, if we were to, you would see similar diagrams like this uh, uh, for cortex. And of course we know that excitatory synapses never form on the cell body. <laughs> that's a, it's an error. It doesn't look like that. And they're always on these dendrites. And as you, you know from our work, that, that you know, the dendritic compartments are really important. So a lot of this literature you'll read about synaptic plasticity completely, I would say 95% of it completely ignores the dendritic properties uh, of, of, and dendritic spikes and the whole thing that we put into the temporal memory algorithm. So you have to be very careful when reading, if you're reading this literature, you have to be very careful to tease about, tease out like sometimes what they describe doesn't really, doesn't apply at all or it applies differently in those situations. So I'm just, just be very cautious. You read these things, you think that people, this is how neurons learn. In reality, they, it's much more complicated because you have to accommodate the dendritic activation zones, which they don't talk about. So memory, if you say like, how do neurons store information? If you look at the temporal memory algorithm we have, it is far more sophisticated in, 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 in an information point of view than almost all these other models you'll read about, but it's much simpler at, at the detail level. Like we don't model the complexity of these synapses, but we model the, the larger scale effects of dendritic uh, segments. And so when you read about the literature of memory formation and synapses, almost nothing will have that information in it. And you, and you just have to, you have to put on really strong filters when you read through that. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, it's frustrating at times. Uh, if, if you don't know that, people just ignore the dendrites. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah, and uh, to have my perspective as someone who has in, uh, in, who's done uh, lab work and, uh, and stuff on this, the, the main reason people have ignored the dendrites for so long is because people didn't really know what happened in them, and it was very hard to record from dendrites for a long I, time. I totally understand um, that. I'm not but of course, I'm not trying to uh, say that you know, people didn't, didn't know that they would be important. It's, um, it's, yeah, I'm not saying, I'm not being critical. I'm, I'm just pointing out that we now, we know that it's important and, and, we, and it's, we, we have to put our own sort of careful filters when we read these things. Um, other people, just, they don't have theories about what the dendrites do. So, um, you know, the, the temporal memory algorithm is really, as far as I know, the first really sort of end-to-end -end information theoretic neural model that incorporates them. Um, so, uh, but we knew though, right? so now we know that we we need to keep thinking about that all the time. It's just and you can read this literature and you can get very confused by it. That's it. Just have to be careful. Absolutely. And uh, one thing uh, is to add is, is, for example, you see this uh, as point uh, as Jeff pointed out, this inaccurate sort of schematic where the uh, the excitatory synapses end on the soma. These in these papers, it's implicit that uh, the reader has read enough uh, you know, neuroscience literature to understand that this is just a cartoon, right? And that the, these, these, uh, uh, these synapses occur on uh, dendritic segments. But it's more than that. It's more than, you know, it's, it's more than that they're out there, that, that they behave differently because they're out there. They don't actually sum at the soma. They sum locally. Yeah. Absolutely, and this yeah, is yeah. assumed as well. So people only add dendrites when it adds a new point that they're trying to make. 
Yeah, so in your case, you showed those figures where they added an apical dendrite. You didn't label it that way, the little vertical on the, the split on the earlier. Yeah. Yeah, on, the, on C and D. And even there, they're saying, oh, look, there's this now a second input. This is an instructive pathway. And so we have, we have synapses on the soma at the, the bottom and the red, and we have one. That's all very cartoonish. Um, um, it, again, even in those uh, apical dendrites, there are hundreds or thousands of synapses up there and multiple integration zones. I'm not, I guess, I'm not being trying to be critical here. I, I, I'm just pointing out that every scientist has their own, if you're studying very specific synaptic properties, then you can ignore all this morphology of the cell and all this other stuff. And it's as, a, as someone trying to come in and do theory, overall theory, it can be very, very difficult to understand what the hell's going on here because they leave out all this information and maybe you're supposed to know it. <laughs> if you're reading these papers and you don't know it, then, and no one knows what, as you point out, there's people ignore it because they didn't know what it does. It's, but it's, it's the elephant in the room, right? You know, neurons have thousands of synapses, not two. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, right. like his picture show. <laughs> so this is stuff that is kind of assumed. And of course, you know, every paper makes a very incremental contribution. So the idea is like, here's a rough sketch of the idea we're proposing. And you need to keep that in mind as well. You don't, you shouldn't see any of these things as a sort of literal interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. But new people to the field have trouble knowing that. Exactly. That's why, yeah. by the way, that's why we label that paper, you know, why do neurons have thousands of synapses? We, <laughs> we start off by saying that's that's like the elephant in the room, you know. Let's talk about that. <laughs> we didn't we didn't say ethereal sequence memory. That was second in the title. Uh, I, I have two questions on the next slide. If you could go back to it, okay. Uh, no, the, the the next slide, not the previous one. Oh, sorry. Uh, so no, no. Uh, so on uh, your left diagram D, what is uh, what's the DC abbreviation referred to? Uh, then, uh, wait, good question. Uh, uh, oh, I was going to try to figure it out from the picture. <laughs> uh, dendritic compartmentalization. <laughs> Let's just look at that. So, uh, uh, I don't know why they have an up arrow on there. What does that mean? Is an increase in dendritic compartmentalization. Spike? Uh, I, this wasn't maybe, really in the text. Is that like a dendritic spike, maybe? I don't know. What the hell is that? Uh, this is, a, yeah, I think what they mean is uh, maybe things like uh, Suwutai mentioned earlier, the fact that there are several mechanisms in the dendrite that compartmentalize um, information and there's feedback loops uh, and that sort of thing. I, I'm not really sure. They, they don't mention it specifically, or maybe I just was blind for a second uh, when reading the, the review. And this is not something I'm an expert on, so. Yeah, you know. Um, I should point out, uh, one of the co-authors, uh, Jeff McGee, um, you know, he is very much uh, aware of uh, active dendrites and dendritic spikes and, and so on. I mean, he's one of the key people who's worked on that. Uh, so I would, I'd be surprised if, uh, you know, that didn't factor into his thinking somehow. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So yeah, these are, yeah, these are uh, just, a, you have to take everything with a bit of salt and ask yourself, what do I remember about this? Or do I need to read more about this? Um, and yeah, of okay. course, there's different levels of abstraction neuroscientists work on. So systems neuroscientists often don't look at dendrites and complex mechanisms within because it's not the level of abstraction they're looking for. They're looking at sort of what sort of signals are sent in and out and what sort of uh, circuits do, what comparisons they make, for example. And they assume there's some interesting stuff happening in the dendrites and axons that other people will take care of <laughs> at some point. Um, so the second question I had on that uh, oh. diagram was on the right-hand side, your, uh, the uh, sub-image D. What are you trying to, what's trying to show there is, I, I, I assume that the blue, uh, bar corresponds to the blue bar that's over on the diagram C, but I'm trying to figure out wh what is it trying to illustrate? All right, so I think this is the start of the trial, right, when the mouse starts approaching this area, I guess. Um, and I think this wants to illustrate the fact, the, the, the crazy time scale of this, the fact that these uh, calcium plateaus can uh, last for seconds, uh, which is unusual 
in, when we're talking about like intracellular timescales uh, in, uh, in neuroscience. Uh, and so what, basically the, the mechanism that I'm learning is the mouse starts here and it gets all these excitatory inputs, right? So picture these excitatory inputs sort of spread out over here in time. But the cell is inactive, right? Because of inhibition. And then this plateau occurs. So this plateau will enforce synapses, uh, enforce synapses of activations that happened around that time. So the, this blue thing here will mean that because this, the synapse that occurred around three seconds gets a little bit potentiated. The one around four seconds gets more potentiated and around five gets really potentiated. Uh, means that the, you can create this sort of ramp over here, uh, which means that after this little blue bar, the cell, the cell slowly starts firing or being- Is, uh, is, D, just an ex is D just an expansion of B? Is it the same thing as B? It just expanded out with the yeah. time? It's just the same thing. Yeah, there's this panel. Yeah, they're just showing the time scale of this. Um, okay, okay. That, that's what I was uh, unclear because I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to think it was, there was a, um, progression there that you get to see where the things are being integrated, then I was trying to, uh, so they're actually, okay, if, 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 if D is just an expanded version of B, then I understand what's going on. Okay. okay. Um, so in the frame, uh, thing about continuous learning, this allows you to create predictive learning, for example, that also doesn't need the Hebbian component uh, specifically. So, uh, and wrapping up very quickly, uh, this is uh, in, the, in the paper of quote unquote uh, journal clubbing, they call it complementary learning systems theory. It's otherwise known more famously as a uh, systems consolidation. Is the fact that there's an interplay between the hippocampus and the cortex that uh, the hippocampus can learn new associations very quickly, but the storage of them happens in the, in the cortex. And this is something that takes hours to days. Uh, to happen. And also I would like to point out that the representations here at the hippocampus and cortex are different. The hippocampus is extremely sparse and sparse not only in the way that there's a low activity, uh, sparse, sparse I mean in uh, uh, when an event occurs, the activation is not only sparse in terms of uh, how many neurons are active but also the representation is very compact let's say. Whereas in the cortex the representations are sort of overlapping and distributed. So they are still sparse but uh, you know, a certain memory, uh, uh, <clears throat> a certain concept will activate several neurons and then adjacent, and another concept will activate many of those neurons as well. So different, um, and different sort of degrees or um, specificities in uh, triggering uh, a memory, for example, will result in different overlaps of these uh, ensembles, uh, which allows you to create sort of different flavors of uh, memories and a sort of continuous component to them. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a point, uh, there's a point of this, well, unless you want to finish the slide, I don't know what's up else on the slide. Uh, the rest of the slide is about, um, yeah, how memory recall rewrites memory, so it's probably a little bit different. Let me just, before you get onto that, which is a fascinating topic, uh, um, you'll re what, if you read about this, um, people sort of say like, oh, the hippocampus remembers things really quickly, there's your episodic memory. Um, and then it's stored in the neocortex, and people used to believe that it's like transferred to the neocortex, and they still talk about it that way. And um, I never believed that, because neurons don't have the ability to transfer memories. And it's been shown now that it's not true, that memories in the cortex do not get transferred, it's not transferred to the hippocampus. They're, they're learned simultaneously, but at a much slower rate. And yeah. so um, it, what, what's surprising though, is if you remove the hippocampus, the learning in the neocortex doesn't occur. But I just want to make the distinction. It's not like you learn at one place and then it, over the course of a month, it's moved someplace else. That, that's not true. It's learned quickly in the neocortex, in the hippocampus. It's learned slowly in the neocortex, separately formed memories. And uh, yet, if you remove the hippocampus, for some reason no one knows yet, uh, at least I don't know if they know, um, the memory, if you remove the hippocampus, the neocortex stops its learning process and it never forms a long-term memory. So just, just uh, the, the literature is infused with that incorrect idea uh, because what people believe for decades, it's not true. Um, so just well, the, yeah, so there is a component where the hippocampus itself talks to the cortex a lot too, right? So the, that yeah, they, they do communicate, but it's been shown experimentally 
that is not a transfer. Um, oh yeah, it's not. But the, the, the learning is initiated in the cortex as well, but there's an interplay that happens with the hippocampus that uh, affects the consolidation mm -hmm. uh, of that memory. Yeah, 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 it, yeah, that's right. Because as I said, if you, if you remove that connection, you remove the hippocampus, then the neocortex does not form those memories. Um, uh, it just it's just this idea of storage is learned here and stored elsewhere is this yeah. implication like a computer it's not like that well, and i think this is, i think by the way i think this is very important because when i think about a cortical column it's been shown that cortical columns can learn very quickly too um this has been shown and um and so it's 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 more like the cortex in, in my mind is a hypothesis but in the more in my mind the hippocampus is designed for the super fast learning and the neocortex is, is designed um, for more long-term memory. It's much larger. It's physically much, much larger. You have a lot more little storage area there. Um, but it, they're both doing the same thing. They're just doing it at different time scales and different speeds. Uh, it's not like they're fundamentally different processes. I, I don't believe that. That's Je Jeff, if, if that's the case, and if yeah. they're both learning, but one's learning faster than the other, what presents the persistent signal that the neocortex derives its learning from. There's got to be something that has to be persistent in order, if it's got a slower learning rate, the events have come and gone. What's, what's, what's well, offering I, the thing? Uh, well, first of all, um, uh, the formation of, and maybe, in, and Iris is gonna to get to this in a second here, but you know, one thing, for example, y you, can, you can be exposed to something and it may take hours for a new synapse to appear but once you start that process, it's, it keeps going. So a, a very momentary event can lead to a consolidate, lead to a more a permanent type of memory, but it may take a couple hours for the synapse to occur. Um, um, and so, you know, once you kick it off in some sense, it, you know, it may take it hours to a day to, to, to finish the process. That's one thing. It's not, it doesn't have to be constantly reinforced. So this is why some of these memory mechanisms are, you know, they require gene expression and protein synapses, the protein formation and so on. And once that, once that process is going, it, it kind of finishes out over the day type of thing. Um, okay, uh, so, so. But other, and the other things are for longer term things, there's, and I don't, I don't know the literature on this, and I don't know if anyone knows it, but maybe someone else does, that there, there, there is this issue that you need, to, this idea that you need to replay these memories over and over again somehow um, in order to continue that, cons that learning process. So some people believe that's happening during sleep. Um, you know, that's one hypothesis that you know, during sleep, you're sort of re 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 replaying these memories so that they, you continue to live for, you know, learn them over the course of days. Um, there's this other hypothesis that you're gonna see in a moment here, I think, where every time you think of the same thing again, it's, 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 actually, it's actually doing something metabolically interesting. <laughs> um, uh, so that's a good question, and I don't know all the details. I don't know if anyone does. Yeah, right. So there is a lot of literature on uh, replay during sleep, and not only during sleep, replay also happens kind of all the time in a, in a different flavor. Uh, so this is where you get like the source of continual input. Um, and furthermore, when replay happens uh, and during sleep, the, it's not like the same memory, the same activation trace is just being replayed over and over. They, they, they change, right? You're, you're creating, you're adding like maybe a more general, like a generalization of the memory, for example, or its relationship to other things that were experienced. Yeah, I think, I think you're going to get that in the next piece here, which is, a, I think maybe she just jumped to that. Uh, yeah. this, me this memory recall re rewrites memories. This is an amazing idea. It is amazing. Uh, and uh, I only remembered this like 10 minutes before, so <laughs> I, I don't have any uh, uh, figures or anything. But basically what happens is when uh, you recall a memory, there's synaptic plasticity that happens that basically changes the synapse. And basically it changes your memory a bit as well. So your memory, this is one of the reasons why uh, memories deteriorate, become more vague and abstract over time, is that as you recall them, they change uh, and for they can be to the effect that, to the uh, extent that they can become completely fictitious it's very easy to con convince someone that they had an experience that they never had um, so this is something i just wanted to uh, discuss i mean maybe we're running out of time but uh in the context of continuous learning you know this is obviously if it happens in the brain uh it has it has to be very beneficial right so there's maybe a component of uh, like i said generalization 
That's funny. I, I, it may be right, Iris. I don't know. I, I assume the opposite. I assume it's detrimental and it, it's, it's just a, it's a physics problem in some sense. Right? And I guess we don't know which of those approaches is correct. To, to me, this reminds me of semiconductor memories where you might say like, oh, um, here's a semiconductor, it's permanent. Here's a, here's a permanent semiconductor memory. But when you read from it, you destroy this, the memory. <laughs> it's yeah. like, and therefore you have to write it out again. Um, and when you write it out again, you might make errors in writing it out again. Um, so it could be, I've always assumed that I could be wrong. I've always assumed that this is not beneficial, but, but this is actually just a limit to how the, the biological physics work. Um, and, uh, but I might be wrong about that. Maybe it is beneficial. Um, so I, I thought it could be beneficial in the sense that basically, uh, in the sense here, experiences are very correlated uh, with each other. So every time you see a fire truck, it's going to be a very similar looking fire truck, for example. And there's a continuity in time uh, and space with, uh, with your experiences. So what you're basically what you're doing is like you're reactivating, you know, a memory uh, and the memory is like, it still preserves the gist of what happened. It's just sort of the details of it have changed. And that's probably because they're not important. And as you alluded to earlier, there's things that you were like, you want to never forget. And that does happen. Yeah. You can have these memories that are basically, and that's kind of how PTSD works initially, that you have these memories that basically do not want to go anywhere. Yeah, I um, guess, well, it's a good hypothesis. We, I guess we, I, I would argue, we, we just don't know why this rewriting occurs. It could be beneficial. It could be detrimental. Obviously, if you remember things that didn't really happen, which, which we do, uh, as you point out, if you just have someone remember something over and over again, and every time you remember it, you sort of say it a little differently, then they actually form a memory of the incorrect thing. And they, they swear that something happened that didn't happen. It, 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 we're all susceptible to this. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I would argue that the benefit comes from the, the fact that you, uh, you want to create a very general synthetic kind of uh, memories and learning in order to... Uh, but you don't want it to be inaccurate either. So, um, right, you don't. So that, yeah, but they can be inaccurate to the extent where like the, the gist of it or the thing that you've learned from it is, uh, is still roughly the same. All right. I would say the verdict is out on this one. We don't know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would just say like this would be an interesting thing to... Uh, what, one of the things that strikes me about this is that if what's happening is that the brain is trying to recast the new memory in terms of components of things that it's already learned and trying to assemble them yeah. uh, as a, as a this compression is, mechanism. Way, this is not, by the way, uh, Kevin, this is not like a new memory overwrites the old memory. This is you recalling something overwrites the memory. So just the fact that you thought, that I said, oh, what did you have for breakfast this morning? And you, t and you think of it, the thinking of it actually damages the memory of it. <laughs> and so you're not adding any new information. You're not integrating a new experience with an old experience. You're just degrading the original experience. But I would be reasonably confident that you can sort of add the fact that something activates that memory. It can add, like you can incorporate that fact into the new memory. Uh, yeah, but, but you can see where it gets wrong. You, you take a witness who observed a crime and the woman committed the crime. There's a man and the woman, the woman committed the crime. By just talking to that person who observed the crime over and over again, you can convince them that the man did the crime. Literally, you can do this. This, is, yeah. this has been shown. And, and that is not adding any, it's just fake, it's wrong. So look, I, th I think we don't know. Uh, I, I think we should just say this is a really fascinating component here and we should, uh, it's just something to keep filed away that it may be important, it may not be important, but I don't think we really know why this is occurring at this yeah. point in time. But I, I am very bored with uh, uh, Kevin's idea of like the synthesis, but yeah, like you said, the jury's out. Yeah, um, he's out. Right, so that was it, uh, everything I had to say. I, I, I was just like, you know, along the lines of weird things like rewriting the memory, I, 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 I've often brought this up. I'll bring this up again. Some of you remember this. But there are people who are, the, you know, they're called savants. Yes. And a savant is someone who, they're pretty normal. Um, some of them are. They're pretty normal people. They, uh, but they have some very unusual properties. One property is often a you know, savant can have this tremendous photographic memory. I mean, like, unbelievable things they can read a hundred books and remember every word on every page i'm not joking it, it, people who can do this and um or there's another guy who's a famous artist he they flew him around rome in a helicopter for 20 minutes 
And then over the course of the next month, he drew a picture of Rome and he had every building and every window and the right number of windows. And the, I mean, incredible details. Um, they don't generalize well. They, they don't see the bigger picture in things um, as a general rule, but they, so the, the interesting thing, a story about this is these brains are pretty normal. They're not like some alien brain. They're like a human brain with some tweak to them. And it shows that the neocortex with that tweak can form this incredibly detailed, precise, huge volume of data. It's, it's not a, and so it's, it's like the same basic structure of the brain can do this with a different set of learning rules. Um, and that's another interesting tweak. It, it shows that there's, there's, there's the ability to remember incredible complex details. That is the structure of the brain can support that but we generally don't do that. We generally do this more of a, uh, we would don't want to remember those details. We want to do more of the generalization. So I, I just threw that out. It's, it's sort of along the lines of the recall, uh, rewrites the memories thing. It's like, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah one interesting fact about Savant and uh, shows that they can generalize, that they can't recognize people because they have to see that same person with different expressions in order to recognize someone so if they only see jeff smiling and then jeff's serious they won't be able to tell it's jeff so you say they do have that problem or they don't have that problem no they, they have that problem they can't oh, recognize yeah. this interesting i didn't know that i think there's yeah, a lot I, of different types of savants in, in terms of what they can and can't yeah that's right i think there's some who have lots of cognitive problems, but some who don't. Some who seem pretty normal until you, until you spend some time with them, I guess, and, and you realize it. Yeah, interesting. Right. Uh, so yeah, I don't know uh, if we have time. Uh, sorry, Jeff, for this. No, it's all right. I, 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 I don't really know what, it, that was fun. Um, I, I don't know, what time is it now? 11.35. Um, I can do my thing anytime. I could do it another time. It's probably 15 minutes or so. Uh, you want to do it? You want to do it now? I can or, do it now if, if you want to do it now. That's fine with me. Yeah. All right. And for those who weren't on the conversation Monday, this might not be interesting to you. You could drop off if you want. But uh, okay. Do you see my? Pro you see this PowerPoint here? You got that? You yeah, see? we see it. Yeah. All right. So so. Um, Quickly, this is this image from this uh, Goo Tank paper that we've used a lot. I'm just fascinated with this image. And um, we were talking on Monday, uh, this is a grid cell module divided into six uh, phase quadrants. Um, and I'm not gonna explain this right now, uh, but the question is what were we actually seeing here? What was the technique they used to, to determine this image? Uh, which we had some questions about it like, um, how are they determining, is this a slice of cells or is this a depth image of cells? How, you know, when they're looking at the medial and serrano cortex, what are they actually picturing when they do this image? So uh, I, I delved into some papers about this. Um, uh, and so in these, these slides, I'm showing the title of the paper and the authors up on the left-hand side here. Again, this is a good tank. This is the good tank, um, uh, another good tank paper. Uh, some other people too. Anyway, in this particular image, here's a rat cortex, the medial enterocortex, uh, well, this is, a P, uh, P, uh, this is a different part of the brain, but they're, they're using this technique. The technique is they have a, um, um, let me see if I can show you a picture of it here. Like you see my cursor, there is a, there is a, uh, a prism uh, that they have that they sort of stick into, whoops, let me go back here. In this case, they're trying to image this piece of cortical tissue, which is hidden in this fissure. So they, they need to look at it from the side. So like the, the vert, you see this red oval, that's, that is, the, um, that, that is the, the, the part of the cortex they're trying to look at, and it's facing to the right, if you will, meaning that layer one would be on the right of this figure and layer six would be, well, not, layer six is on the left, that kind of thing. So they insert this, they insert this prism into the brain of the, the rat, in this case, over here, this is not, uh, here's, if they're doing it with the medial enterocortex. cortex, so here we go, they want to insert that prism in there. And so now they have this imaging system which can, can look down, reflect sideways, and look at that, um, that part of the cortex. So that's, that's how these were done. Here you see it in a, in a bigger picture here. They're, they insert this prism, whoops, damn it, sorry, excuse me. Um, this prism, which sort of slides the tissue apart, and now they have their objective of their, their, uh, their 
microscope up here. Now these are two photon imaging uh, microscopes and I didn't get, I, I was less interested in the exact physics, how this works, and more interested in about what they're actually measuring. What are they, what are, what are we looking at? Um, and so I'll talk about that briefly, but the way, the, the general idea how these, these microscopes work is they have, they're, they're emitting um, light, two light sources at the same time, and you're relying on them coincidentally hitting the same spot, and they can do this really, really fast. So these, pul these lasers are extremely, are pulsed at extremely fast, uh, I think femtosecond type of time frames. And what they can do is they can, they can measure the activity of a cell at, at, at a very precise point, one point at a time. And then they scan to the next point, and the next point, and the next point. And so they, could, they basically measure a whole bunch of points really rapidly, and they build up a two-dimensional image. That's the basic way. And, and Aris, if I'm getting this wrong, let me know. because I, I, um, Yeah, just quickly, uh, the two sources of light, uh, what do you mean, is the two photons? So, uh, you, yeah, two lasers, so basically, each one of these pulses is roughly two photons. Um, and then the, the reason you can do this exact X, Y, Z um, resolution without interference from other light sources, uh, other fluorescent sources, is the fact that it's uh, much less likely that uh, two photons of half the wavelength, so, uh, sorry, twice the wavelength, half the energy, uh, everyone get that. I mean, it's... Yeah, that's, this is why I didn't. Oh, this is why I avoided the physics. The physics is interesting, but I'm not. It wasn't my point. My point was in this investigation was to figure out what are they actually looking at, and this gives you this image gives you a better uh, sense of what they're actually looking at. In this case, they're showing. Uh, okay, they're going to image this section of some some part of the rat's brain here, and and then on this this E panel, you see the very bright. Um, yellow line that is essentially showing how th th what they're looking at they're looking at a very thin as you pointed out on monday Aris, it's almost like it's it's extremely thin much smaller than a neuron <laughs> um, um this this uh sort of plane here so if the, if the cells intersect this plane they can look at the cell if it's a little bit off this plane they won't see it at all so you're getting this very very precise thin slice and, and in this case, they're looking at the medial lentil ional cortex. This is an expansion of this image over here. So they're trying to get a, a slice through this. And now, now that very thin slice could be, it's basically like a layer. It could be in a layer two or layer three, but layer two and layer three are much thicker than this, right? They're not infinitely thin planes. Yeah, and so it. you're looking at an infinitely thin plane, virtually infinitely thin plane through this. In this particular paper, they were saying, oh, this slice here, this yellow line, it was about, a, I think it was like 120 microns from the surface. And they, they, they were determining, or are they looking at the same depth here and the same depth here? And they said, well, it was in plus or minus 20 microns, meaning they're still looking at an infinitely thin plane, but they're moving up and down in the cortex, maybe about over 20 microns as from one end to the other or 40 microns. So um, they're saying, that, and they were using that to argue we're still in layer two of the medial antral line cortex, even though we're varying so this, as, as you said on Monday, Eris, this is a very, very thin slice here uh, that they're looking at. And so, uh, and they can get that very rapidly, even though they're only looking at one point at a time. So they can make movies of this two dimensional image by looking at one pixel at a time, but they're doing it millions and millions of times a second um, uh, as they're going through it. Now, I thought, here's some, uh, now I'm gonna, that's, that's all I'm gonna say about the technique that they're using. Uh, and now I've discovered some interesting observations that came out of reading these papers. Uh, so here's another one. Um, this uh, was by, I don't know, Hayes, Ren, Ren Garcian, and Dombeck. Um, now, this is an interesting thing. I didn't understand this. Maybe, Marcus, are you on here? Are you listening? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, if you saw these things and you knew this, and I'm getting this wrong, let me know, because I think you've read some of these papers. Um, this, this is... Leave this up on the right. It says grid and non-grid cells are intermixed. So if you look in the medial interina cortex, there are cells that, that look like grid cells, and there are cells that don't look like grid cells. And we'll come and talk about it in a moment. Uh, and and they're saying, oh, the grid cells are clustered together. 
And if, going back to this image here, this is, this is an image from, from Tank where you say, oh, these are grid cells and these are pyramidal cells. They're not grid cells. Well, I don't know. I don't understand this because in this paper, the red dots are grid cells and the blue dots are, are non-grid cells. And they're saying, oh, yes, the red dots are clustered. You can see how they're clustered. And they go through this tech, statistical analysis showing the red cells are clustered. But they're clearly completely intermixed with the blue cells. So, yes, they're technically clustering by, by a statistical metric. But in reality, they're intermixed all over the place. Um, so uh, I just like I didn't understand this. I, didn't I understand mean, part this. of this is co coming from the difficult the uh, experimenters with grid cells. One of the thing, one of the things they face that makes their job difficult is they'll put an electrode in and detect zero grid cells. Put another one in, detect zero. Put another one in, detect ten or something like that. So the point is that from an experimentalist point of view, they're clustered. If you're trying to, no, I, I know, I get that. I'm not questioning that. My point is that, but this is what it actually looked like from this imaging point of view. So in the beginning, they did all these experiments with, uh, with tetrodes, which are, you know, if you don't know what a tetrode is, it's just a little probe you stick in the brain and it can measure along this line of the, of the insertion probe, you can measure cells uh, activity. Um, now they're looking at a two-dimensional array over a much larger area. You can see the 100 micron bar here. So we're looking at hundreds of microns by hundreds of microns. And all I'm pointing out is that the clustering was not as I imagined it. Um, I imagined it was much more really like these are the grid cells and these are not the grid cells. <laughs> it doesn't look like that. Um, they are like this, according to this paper. So that was pretty interesting. I thought, I just, I just want to point that out. Here's another one, uh, um, a different paper. This one, interesting. They were, they were breaking the cells in the median cortex into grid cells, which they counted by 18% of the cells. 9% uh, of the cells were border cells. 1% uh, of the cells are pure head direction cells. And 68% of the cells were non-grid spatial cells. These meaning, these are cells that respond specifically at, at a point in the environment, but they don't seem to do so in a grid-like way. You know, so as the animal's running along the track, this cell will fire at the same point every time when the animal's along that track, but they can't seem to see any sort of grittiness to it. Um, and I was a little bit blown away by that number, like 68%. I, maybe, I just didn't realize that this, you know, so many of these cells are doing something else. Um, and um, so they said in layer two and layer three, uh, these non-grid spatial cells are, are dominant, you know, 68% of them. And they were talking, in this particular paper, they were talking about how they remap, meaning they, they fire in different locations, when you change the room, like you change the shape of the room or the color of the room, where grid cells don't do that. So it seemed to me these are sounding more like place cells. They never said that in this paper. They just said they're non-grid spatial cells. <laughs> but they seem like, there's not what a place cell is like. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's environment dependent, but it's in a particular environment, it's always firing in the same place. So I don't know what to make of this other than I think it looks like there's a bunch of place cells down in the medial antirrhinal cortex. <laughs> um, so I don't know what to make of that. I don't know, if, Marcus, if you had any other thoughts on that. Just the other perspective is uh, it's, uh, some la later work uh, uh, took this observation and said, all right, we need to stop classifying cells as being just a grid cell, just a border cell. Let's, uh, let's, let's treat them more as like, you know, uh, uh, wait, um, 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 there's a whole spectrum. Something is kind of gritty, kind of bordery. And they, yeah. and, and, and so, and this, uh, th this pie chart looks a little bit different uh, if you, if you try to incorporate that fact, but still the, the overall spirit of, of what you said remains that a large percentage of them are like, uh, are, are these funky ones. So when I think about, I think about a cortical column, I'm thinking, well, maybe there's something like this in the cortical column. Remember a cortical column is not the same as the rental rhino cortex and hippocampus, but we're guessing that there's going to be a lot of overlap. And um, so when I'm thinking about a cortical column, I used to be thinking, okay, I had this beautiful array of grid cells down there, like I saw in the tank image. And it's like, well, maybe it's not like that at all. Maybe there's not, maybe 70% of the cells are doing something else. And, you know, and then in only 18% of grid cells and 9% of border cells. And remember on Monday, I was thinking maybe grid cells are sort of a projection of something else which is going on. I don't know what that else is, but here I got 70% of the cells are doing something different and they're sort of uh, partially co-mingled with the grid cells. So like, oh shoot, that's interesting. Um, and then this is a paper, uh, I, I, this was a really super well-written paper. I love the way they did this. Um, this is a Moser paper. 
uh, it's out of the Moser lab. I, I, I guess I don't know most of these uh, uh, Simsola and Sobstad and and Roland and the two Mosers, um, but I, I they, they had these little summaries in them. I just thought it's worth going through them one at a time, just a little bit. These are all like wow things that I didn't really understand. So this is the only place. Um, starting off, this, this is the only place that I. That, that I heard anything about the depth in the in the like what happens as you go deeper and up and down in the depth because of the image we've seen so far is this, this little thin sheet. So here they say um, the mean discreteness for distribution of recording depth was significantly lower than the mean discreteness grid spacing. What they're saying is that the grid cell modules seem to transcend layers. That is, as you go deeper into the up and down the depth of the medial entomonic cortex, the grid cell property of that particular section seems to be maintained. Meaning the cells, there are more grid cells in the depth as you go deeper. So it is a three-dimensional structure and it doesn't appear like, it appears like there are grid cells as you go deeper. So this gets back to the issue, you know, I was talking about mini columns and the potential for mini columns um, and how you could have multiple cells representing the same grid depth. Well, there are multiple cells representing the, the same grittiness as you, as the depth of, as you go in and out of the depth of the cortex. Uh, just uh, I'm curious. So, in uh, <clears throat> as you go down different layers in the same chunk, uh, do these grid cells have like a very similar uh, phase difference? And yeah. Like well, first of all, we're not talking about layers. We're just talking about this. Go down the next twenty microns and the right. next yeah, twenty microns. So we can all be in layer two. Yeah. Well, that the, the, that's what the suggestion here was that that, that they when they, the discreteness the, the word discreteness in this case was referring to their phase. And their okay. uh, where do they and where and their and their orientation in the, and their um, and their, their uh, locking in you know this cell responds at this phase at this phase spacing at this point right or this phase at this point and the cells seem to be they're burning out as they went through the depth the cells had the cells had shared all these properties but when you went laterally they changed. Okay. Uh, and of course, they do this in a scientific way, where they say the distribution of this, you know, um, um, the discreteness was significantly lower, meaning that there was less change as you went into the depth, significantly less change as you went into the depth, and much more change when you went horizontally. I think, this, if I remember correctly, this paper uh, is really mostly talking about scale and orientation. They they don't know. Uh, uh, I don't think they reported much on the phase of nearby grid cells, phase of grid cells. Uh, yeah, on the I, uh, maybe you're right. I thought this discreteness word incorporated that too, but I could be wrong, Marcus. So um, that's a good catch. Uh, we be careful about that. I thought it was, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, this next point, um, just no one ever talks about this, but you know, there's two sets of, the, the entheronic cortex exists in two parts, and so does the hippocampus on two sides of the brain. And they've only pointed out that, um, and when you look at the two sides of the brain together, the mean values of grid scale and grid orientation were identical on the left and right. So even that, the, as if the two, the, the equivalent grid cell module on the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain both locked on the same orientation. Uh, it, they were not independent. So I thought it was interesting. Um, they talked about here in uh, grid cell, grid fields are often, um, uh, elongated in one direction. They, they, we think of them as, as circular dots, but they're saying this is often not the case. Um, they have asymmetric grid firing fields. Uh, I think we've seen that in some other papers too, but it's, 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 they made a point of saying this. Um, and they say that the, um, the asymmetries are consistent within the module. So with all the cells in the, in the module seem to have the same elongation um, uh, and it changes per environment. And it cuts across uh, cortical layers. Um, this is just something we've talked about. The number of grid cell modules is small and probably in the upper single digit range. So we were talking about that yesterday. Um, this is the issue that we've talked about this in the past too, that there's this progression of between the modules at about, you know, 1.42 scaling, which turns out to be doubling. So the, as you go from uh, medial to dorsal, meaning from the inner of the brain to the surface of the brain, the modules sort of, uh, uh, scale up, uh, not incrementally, but uh, at these discrete points, uh, discrete uh, translations. Um, it says the modules of grid cells with similar geometric properties are discrete and also regard, oh, this is an interesting one. So, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, so they looked at the theta frequency, um, uh, 
that is exhibited within a grid cell module. So you can look at, well, what's the sort of background theta frequency going on? And it was per grid cell module, meaning the next grid cell module over would have a different theta frequency. But within that grid cell module, all the, everywhere you observed, there was the same theta frequency. And you go to the next grid cell module, they all have a, you know, it, they're, so they each, it, so the, there's not only a, you know, a size, a phase size, if you will, for each grid cell module, there's also this, the, whatever theta frequency is operating at that moment in time is unique per grid cell module. It's not per interamic cortex, which I thought was interesting. Um, this uh, third to last one here. Um, uh, uh, some of the grid cell modules responded independently to the location. Well, these are, oh, um, they're just, this is more evidence, I think, that the grid cell modules are actually sort of operating independently of each other, uh, if I recall. Uh, evidence that grid cell modules operate independently of geometric. The geometric inputs referring to here when they change like the size of the room. So, you know, when you change the size of the room, here's what it was. If you, if you sort of incrementally change the size of the room, the grid cell modules, uh, the grid cells sort of, ex some of them will sort of stretch. And at some point they stop stretching and then they remap it or something like that. Um, well, different modules stretch. Some modules will stretch, some modules will remap earlier. And, and, and when they remap and when they stretch is independent. The modules do it on their own. There's no coordination between them. Um, uh, this was the point. We, this is, I think, is where we got the idea in our papers that multiple grid cell modules could uh, lead to a unique location. So they say in here, this is a quote, computational simulations have shown that convergence of signals from only two to four independently aligned grid cell modules may be sufficient to obtain near complete remapping um, in downstream place cells, meaning that that, that gives you a a unique location. Uh, so they were arguing you only need two, oops, only need two to four independently aligned grid cell modules. I'm not sure, I, I think that's not enough. I think that's, it, it, it worked for one environment, it doesn't work for multiple environments. And then um, there was, not in this paper, but in one paper, and I forgot where it was, my last point here, uh, and I put it as extra because I forgot where it came from, um, that one of the papers talked about that there is this axonal clustering that exists in the medial lateral cortex, which is exactly what we see in the, in the neocortex. In the neocortex, the mini columns, uh, one of the definitions, one of the defining characteristics of mini columns is that the axons of a bunch of pyramidal cells get grouped together in like a, a cord or a bundle uh, and, and of all the, those pyramidal cells in a particular section of a mini column. And apparently there's similar sort of axonal clustering going on in MEC, um, which, which is very interesting, which I'm glad to see. Uh, they didn't use the word mini column, they just said there's axonal clusters um, that look like mini columns. And what it made me think is, is something I've been coming up to recently, is that if we think about the cortex, we think about the upper layers and the lower layers. The upper layers, and we have this mini column that spans between them, but it might be that the upper layers are, uh, have their own sort of mini column, um, operational property and the lower layers have their own separate mini column operational properties and they just have they're, they're co-aligned um, and 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 um, but but it really may be like they're doing separate things the, the mini columns and the bottom layers and the mini columns and the upper layers it's, it's anyway it's, it's suggestive of that so that, that's in my report for yesterday's reading I went through that really quickly but hopefully um, well, uh, so I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I, we were probably supposed to start lunch right now, but there was the one thing I came here one, like the thing I was really curious to hear, maybe you said this quickly or in the beginning, uh, in the David Tank picture where it's showing the grid cells spaced on the cortical sheet. Uh, now, do you see that as a small sampling of the grid cells or do you see it as being a large sampling of the grid cells that are there? I think, this is, I think this is showing all the grid cells that they could detect in one infinitely thin slice. Okay. And, so, but I so think there may be a, that there's a, there's a but there's a three dimensional depth here. They're not showing. Okay. Right. So, so there's not just one red cell here. There's other ones underneath it. Okay. So we can't look at this and say like, Oh, there are only a small number of good cells total. No, uh, there, there no. might be a lot of them. Yes. But I don't think they're different. I think they're copies of what we're seeing here. That, that would be, that, that's, that's a bit beyond what the data showed, but that was what the data was suggesting. That, that this is a slice, and so it, it, it made me a slightly encouraged, Marcus, about the hypothesis I had that, that in, a, in a cortex, there may be five to 10 um, 
uh, grid cells in the mini column that are all basically representing the same phase and so on. There's sort of, and uh, this hypothesis that it might be like the temporal memory mechanism. You might have five to 10 cells that are all basically identical, but at any point in time, one may be active, one not be active, like our temporal memory. Um, and um, it gave me confidence to say that that's not a stupid idea. It may actually be happening in the antiranal cortex too, that there may be 10 cells or five cells underneath this red one here. Um, and there might, be an, there might be cells underneath this blank, blank area here too. We just didn't intersect them. So, um, but the point that, that, that there'd be multiple cells with pretty much the same receptive field properties or the grid cell properties stacked on top of one another and that there is evidence that there's even mini column like structure here. That was, to me, that's the, that was a, maybe the big walkway. I sort of deduced that I'd like to see that. And this data supported it. it didn't, it's not confirmating, but it supported it. And so on that note, I think we should, uh, so sorry, we Kevin, should, uh, do you have a exit. very quick question and then we should probably stop it. Yeah, yeah so, this is so, gradually becoming lunch. Yeah, sorry. Right, let me just ask the quick question. So in the mini column analog on that diagram, what would you say the dimension, the lateral dimension of a mini column would be? I, I don't know. Um, I would, uh, you know, I would guess in, a, in a, everything in the court, in a rat, we think is a mini column now, we think of maybe like 20 microns. And so it would be a six of this. If you're still seeing my image, are you seeing the tank image? Yeah. Okay, that, that's 20 microns. So you take a six of that, that's close to the, that's a little bit larger than one of these dots. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording now.